Amen. Before we get started, let's give God a name. Clap. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. I was sitting at home and I was like, I don't feel like going to Bible study. I, I said that tonight. I said, even said, I don't feel like going to Bible study. God said, you better get up, boo. So it's God said, you better go get to work. Amen. Turn to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 4. The book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 53, verse 4. And when you guys say amen, it's a heavy, it's a heavy word tonight. When you guys say, man, ain't nobody got no amens yet. Amen. All right, we got a couple. Amen. Isaiah 53. Go to Isaiah 53, verse 4. And it says this. Surely he had borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken and spent of God and afflicted. Surely he had borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken and spent of God and afflicted. Amen. God came to carry your grief and your sorrow. God came to carry your grief and your sorrow. What is grief? Grief is when your head, your heart is heavy. Grief is when you stressed out and you worried about something. Grief is when it doesn't make sense and it's bothering you. God says, I came to carry your grief. The problem with a lot of us is we try to carry our own grief. We try to deal with our own problems. Uh, it's interesting, here in the city of Compton, you have almost 30 liquor stores. You have about 10 weed shops. And we ain't talking about the men who sell pills all over the place. We have all these drugs and all these different things because so many people are trying to deal with their own problems. You're trying to fix your own self. You're trying to fix your broken heart. And you're trying to deal with this. And God says, that's not your job. He says, you can't fix yourself. And when you figure that out, that you can't fix yourself, and you give your heart to God, that's when God can work with you. You don't want to be the person that's drinking for 40, 50 years, trying to fix a broken heart for something to happen to you when you're a child. You don't want to be that young man that's popping pills. It's crazy. Tonight, as I was driving here to church and I went to go pick up the pizza, I passed by a hundred homeless people. I passed by a hundred people who have broken dreams and broken promises. Because they tried to fix their own selves by popping a pill. They tried to fix their own selves by drinking too much. They tried to fix their own selves by smoking a crack pipe. They tried to fix their own selves by taking a bag of heroin and sticking it in their arm. And all they found was trouble. All they found was pain. Because when you try to fix yourself, you're broken. If you're broken, you can't fix brokenness. But we serve a God and he says, I can do all things and I can heal you and I can give you a better life and better choices. We have to learn how to give that pain to God. Stop trying to fix yourself. God says that's not your job. Matter of fact, turn to the book of Matthew. Matthew 11. Matthew 11. Matthew 11. Go to verse 28. Matthew 11. Go to verse 28. This is Jesus speaking, and he says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He says, Take my yoke upon you. Learn about me, for I am meek and lowly in, in heart, and ye shall find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. God says, Come to me. He says, You've been working too hard. Come to me. You're tired. Come to me. He says, you're stressed out about what happened. Come to me. He says, take my yoke. He says, let's switch problems. God says, I want to switch problems with you. He says, the problems that you carry are too heavy for you. He says, take my problems because my problems are light. Now, some of you thinking, how is this real? How can God help me? I can't see this God. I can't taste this God. I can't feel this God. How is this God going to come and make my life better? Because I too was heavy burdened. I too was not at ease in the mind. I too was, was low down. I too contemplated suicide. I too contemplated doing things to myself because I was mad at the situation that I was in. But when I learned to give my problems to God, then I became free. See, here's what God does. He says, if you give me your problems, now you don't have any problems. I want you to think about that. Give God your troubles. Do 
Did you know that it's a sin to worry? What you worrying for? Worrying don't change nothing. You can worry about that light bill all you want. It ain't going to pay it. You can worry about that man all you want. It ain't going to change him. You got to learn how to give your problems to God. If you're in a bad marriage, give it to God. If your job ain't working out, give it to God. If your children out of control, give it to God. If your household out of control, give it to God. Whatever it is you're dealing with, learn how to give that pain to God. Because he's the one that says he can fix it. And how do I know this? Because he fixed it in my life. He kept me married so far for 25, 26 years. I should have been divorced 24 years ago. Let me say it again. I've been married 25, 26 years. I should have been divorced 25, 26 years ago. Because if it was based on me, the marriage fell. If it's based on me, my children fell. But when you give it to God, God can do all things. Learn how to give your troubles to God. How do I do that? prayer. Give it to God. Say, God, fix this thing because I can't do it myself. Learn how to pray and watch God move. And when God does this thing for you, you tell a friend. Because once God sees you tell somebody about what he's done for you, he's going to keep blessing you. Every time God blesses me, I tell somebody. Last night at 11.32, I got $2,000 in my bank account. Jesus is good. I've been praying for that money for a long time. The point is, you got to learn how to share your blessings with God. Because the devil wants you to keep it to yourself. Because the devil knows that if you don't give God the praise, the Bible says when praises come up, you know the rest of that blessings come down. Learn how to give the praises up to God. And he will shower your life with blessings. Don't keep the good news to yourself. God is still in the healing business. God is still in the fixing business. You just got to give it to God and trust in him. Next, turn with me back to Isaiah 53 and 5. Isaiah 53 and 5. Thank you, Jesus. Isaiah 53 and 5. And it says this. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. The Bible says, by his stripes, you are healed. Uh, I've been hearing this uh, since I was eight years old. Now, since we first started going to church and I was in third grade, and I kind of understood. By his stripes, we are healed. What does that mean? God says he came to earth and he got beat for us. Uh, it was a movie called The Passion of the Christ. Any of y'all ever seen that? Y'all kind of young. Okay. It was a movie about a you know, white Jesus. We'll let that slide. But long story short, he, he came off the cross and, and they beat him and they beat him and they beat him. The Bible says by his stripes. And what is a stripe? Any of y'all ever got whipped with extension cord? Amen. I, I'm in that ministry. Amen. If you ever got beat with extension cord, wherever it hit, it leaves a mark. That's called a strike. When Jesus got beat, they beat him with whips and they beat him with sticks. And they left marks on his back and marks on his stomach and marks on his arms. And those are called strikes. The interesting thing about a strike is that it reveals healing. It reveals a mark. God said these marks are marks of healing. And he says the healing that's in, in those stripes are the healing that he released for your life. God can heal your situation. God can heal your heart. God can heal everything about you. God can heal your mind. God can heal your family. God can heal your job. God can heal your finances. God can heal your dreams. God can heal everything. You got to give it to God because he says, I've given you the power to have healing. So why don't we have healing? Because most of us don't believe God. I went to the doctor seven, eight years ago and they said, you have diabetes and then they said, you have high blood pressure. And my doctor tried to hand me some pills. And I said, the devil's alive. I said, you keep them pills. 
And I went to my doctor, who generally right across the street from here, the health store, right across the street from here. I went over there and I said, brother, they said I got diabetes and I got high blood pressure. He says, take this apple cider vinegar. He said, take these herbs. He says, I want you to start walking around the track. I want you to go ride your bicycle. That's when I got this dog to start walking them dog. I start walking my dog to ride my bicycle. I went and saw that doctor six months later. And she looked at me. And she looked at the paper, because they did my blood my blood work. And she said, what you been doing? I said, hallelujah. I said, God can fix everything. Give it to God. Give a God a hand clap. You got to learn how to give your problems to God. They said I was diabetic. They said I had high blood pressure. But we gave it to God, and he fixed it. God is still in the healing business. My truck ran my foot over. 5,000 pounds over this right foot. God healed it. I was in a motorcycle accident. Fell down going 90 miles per hour. God healed it. God is still in the healing business. Don't let the devil fool you. The reason why so many people don't get healed is because they don't believe. They think that their doctor has healing. Your doctor is not a healer. Your doctor ain't a good doctor anymore because all they do is, as soon as you go to them, they give you a prescription. All they do is give you a prescription. They don't even talk to you no more. They just give you a prescription. Here you go. Go take these pills. And then you find out the pills got side effects. Next thing you know, you went to the doctor for one thing and something else is broke. Learn how to give it to God because God said, by his stripes, you shall be healed. Next, turn with me. Turn with me. Turn with me. Look at uh, Isaiah 53 and 5. Isaiah 53 and 5. The same verse. Isaiah 53 and 5. It says, but he was wounded for our transgressions. Put a pause in that. The Bible says God was wounded for our transgressions. Does anybody know what a transgression is? What is it? Oh, good. He said, Pat, look at my nephew getting deep. Past acts. Transgression is just a fancy word for sins. The Bible says God was wounded for our sins. Uh, a wound is this. If you ever got shot, that's a wound. If you ever been stabbed, that's a wound. If you ever been in a fight and you was bleeding, that's a wound. The Bible says God was wounded for our transgressions. So as I was reading this today, I was like, okay, I've heard this a thousand times. And then the Spirit said, stop. God said, what is a wound? It's anything that bleeds. That's what a wound is. It's anything that bleeds. Now, the powerful thing is, is that the blood of Jesus Christ gives us power. The blood of Jesus Christ covers our sins. As a matter of fact, turn me to Ephesians 1 and 7. Ephesians 1 and 7. We almost done. Ephesians 1 and 7. Ephesians 1 and 7. Ephesians 1 and 7. It says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, for the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. The Religion Bible translation says this, So overflowing is the kindness towards us that he took away all of our sins through the blood of his son, Christ Jesus, by whom we are saved. When God bled, that blood became a sacrifice. And he uses that blood to cover your sins. See, the thing is, when you sin, something dies. Every time that you sin, something dies. So God says, rather than you dying, use my blood, cover that sin so you can live. Jesus loves you so much that he says, I bled so that your sins can be covered so that you can live. Matter of fact, God says, I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly. God don't want you to struggle too long. God don't want you to be too stressed out. God don't want you to have problems that you can't overcome. He says, I want you to have an abundant life. But that only happens when you learn how to put your faith in Christ Jesus. Stop putting your faith in men. Stop putting your faith in jobs. Stop putting your faith in police officers. Stop putting your faith in the government. you got to learn how to put your faith in Christ. Because it's through him you will have abundant life. Man can't give you what God can give you. The only thing a man can do for you 
is disappointing. But if you trust in God, he will make a way. And we always open doors to a brighter day. Go back to Isaiah 53 and 5. Go back to Isaiah 53 and 5. We're going to be on this one for a second. Isaiah 53 and 5. Isaiah 53 and 5. Sorry, I lost it that quick. The devil used a liar. There you go. Thank you, Jesus. Isaiah 53 and 5. Let's read the next part of this. It says, he was bruised for our iniquities. He was bruised for our iniquities. Does anybody know what iniquity is? He was bruised for our iniquity. What's an iniquity? Oh, I love it. He says, an iniquity is a sin that you can't stop doing. God says he was bruised for our iniquities. An iniquity is a sin that you can't stop doing. Matter of fact, if you want to find out what your greatest sin is, look at your mama and your daddy. Because your mother and your father often reveal the greatest sins that are in your life. They're called generation curses. We often repeat the same pattern over and over and over again unless you break that curse. The Bible says God says he was bruised for our iniquities. Those sins that you can't stop doing. Those sins that you like to do. Those sins that you do in the secret. The sins that you, that you try to hide, but they keep popping out everywhere. Matter of fact, let's think about this. What is a bruise? Anybody here ever had a bruise before? I've mean, I had fell off everything. A bruise is a visible injury that you can see. A bruise is a physical injury that you can see. Uh, I'm embarrassed to say this, but my baby mama hit me one time. Now I'm embarrassed as a man to say this. She got mad at me. I ain't never this ain't. I've been in gang fights. I've been in jail a few times. I, I'm a capital. I've been in fraternity fights. I have never got hit in my eyeball. My baby mama got so mad at me one time. She just socked me and she had a little bitty hands and they fit right in my eyeball. I ain't never got hit that hard in my life. I screamed so loud. I, I, that's all you heard. I screamed like a girl. I am embarrassed to tell the story. Long story short, I went to the mirror hours later and I had a black eye. Now I want you to think about this. I'm a man. And brothers are looking at me, what happened, dog? Who jumped you? Who got you? And I couldn't tell nobody. I just said, yeah, I got into a fight at the gas station. Play. I couldn't tell nobody. My baby mama punched me in my eye. I had a black eye. See, a black eye is a bruise. And, the, and that bruise tells you that you was in a fight. Now, let's get back to the word. The Bible says God was bruised for our iniquities. Why would he be bruised for our iniquities? Let me see. Let, matter of fact, turn with me, turn with me, turn with me to Luke. The book of Luke. The book of Luke. Luke 12, verse 2. Luke 12, verse 2. I'm going to read verses 2 to 3. Why would God be bruised for our iniquity? For there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither hid that shall not be known. There whatsoever ye have spoken in the darkness shall be heard in the light. And that which ye have spoken in the ear of the closets shall be proclaimed on the rooftops. We used to say this in the hood. What's done in the dark shall come to the light. You can't hide your iniquities. You can't hide your iniquities. And God wants you to understand that that iniquity that you have is just like that bruise. It's just like that black eye. I couldn't cover up my face and hide that black eye. Everywhere I went, I put on shades. You can still see it outside the shades. I had to walk around with that black eye. And God says this. He was bruised to cover up your iniquities. God was bruised to cover up the sins that you can't stop doing. Let's think about that. God says he was bruised to cover up the sin that you can't stop doing. Turn me to Psalm 32 and 1. Psalms 32 and 1. Why is that important? Psalms 32 and 1. Psalms 32 and 1. Psalm 32 and 1. He says this. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven and whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man whom the Lord imputed not iniquity and whose spirit there is no guilt. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven and whose sin is covered. God loves you so much that he will protect you from you. 
What do you think about that? God loves you so much that he will protect you from you. See, your iniquity is a sin that can get you in trouble. R. Kelly has an iniquity, got him in trouble. Bill Cosby has an iniquity, got him in trouble. Henry Ruggs, the, the Raiders of, a receiver, had an iniquity, got him in trouble. See, that iniquity, if you don't get control of it, it's going to get you in trouble. It can cause you death. It can send you to prison. It can hurt somebody else. It can take somebody else's life. And everybody in this room has an iniquity. Even those children have an iniquity because they came from their mother and their father. But God says, if you get with him and you trust him, he will protect you from your iniquity. You want God to have that relationship with you. So that when he see that, that's why I go bicycle riding in the middle of the night. Because I know I got some sins inside of me that can get me caught up. I should have been in jail a long time ago. I should have been dead a long time ago. But God ordered my steps and he protects me from my iniquities. See, I'm not perfect. I got sins too. Matter of fact, turn me, turn with me, turn me to 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles. Uh, very good. 2 Corinthians 12. 2 Corinthians 12. 2 Corinthians 12. Go down to verse 9. 2 Corinthians 12. Go down to verse 9. 2 Corinthians 12. Go down to verse 9. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. I'll translate it. Therefore, I take pleasure in my infirmities, in my reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. This is the words of a man named Paul. Paul had some secret sins. Paul had some iniquities that he couldn't get rid of. If you read the passages before that, he asked God to take these sins away from him. He asked God, God, help me to stop doing so with this thing. Whatever he was doing, he didn't want to do it no more. But he kept doing it. It was his sin. It was his iniquity. He was the man that brought Christianity to the world as we know it today. Yet and still, he had a life of sin that he couldn't shake. And God said to Paul, he said, my grace is sufficient. What that means is this. God, when God called him, he knew that he was a sinner with this iniquity. But he said, I'm going to give you enough grace to cover your sin. I'm going to order your steps so that your sins don't destroy you. You want God to be in a relationship with you so that the sins that you like to do don't destroy you. Matter of fact, if you keep walking with God, he will order your steps so that you can't hurt yourself. He will order your steps to keep you out of trouble. He prevent those sins from stopping you. You want that relationship with God. You want that relationship with God. Next, turn with me to Psalm 27. Psalm 27. We almost done. Psalm 27. Verse 5. Psalm 27. Verse 5. Psalm 27. Verse 5. And we're going to read verses 5 through 6. It says, For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion. In his secret tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me up upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted above my enemies round about me. Therefore, I will offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. I will sing yes, and I will sing praises unto the Lord. The Bible says in my time of trouble, God will hide you. I, I've been in a situation where I was in trouble before. Uh, I told you a long time ago when I was a kid, when I was about 10 years old, some boys tried to jump me and stab me to get my bus bags. And I had to hide behind a trash can. And I had to watch them run by. And when they ran by, I ran and ran up to the bus. The bus, it's still, just so happened, God ordered the steps. I'm hiding behind a trash can. And they ran by, just like some on TV. And then the bus came. And I ran and jumped on the bus. And then the bus took off. God will hide you. And the crazy thing about it, those boys chased me for one mile. I ran from Western to Normandy, getting chased 
by some young men who had a knife who wanted to do something bad to me. But the thing is, God will hide you. God will hide you from predators. I remember one time, my, my car is about to get towed away. My little monster, long story short, I ain't paid the bill. I didn't have no money. I was out of money. And the repo man had found my house. And he had came and had backed the tow truck up to my car. But long story short, that green truck that you see was parked right behind the Mazda. And he came and knocked on the door. He said, can you move your truck? And I looked at him. I said, the devil's alive. And I said, thank you, Jesus. I said, if you can't move it, I ain't moving it. God will protect you and hide you. Even even when you don't, even when you can. Learn how to trust in God. I've seen God bail me out of more trouble than anybody that I know because I know I trust in God. And God will protect you from you. He'll protect you from your mistakes. But you have to learn how to trust Him and believe Him and trust in His Word. Next, turn with me to Haggai 2 and 8. Haggai 2 and 8. Haggai 2 and 8. We almost done, promise. We almost done. Haggai, two and eight. You got your cell phone, so it ought to help you. It says, the silver is mine, and the gold is mine, saith the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter house shall be greater than the former, saith the Lord of hosts. And this place will I give peace, saith the Lord of hosts. Uh, today, I was uh, trolling online while I was at work. Long story short. I came across this story of a pastor who committed suicide. And I was like, whoa. So I clicked on the story and I watched the story. And it turns out in the last five years, several pastors have been killing themselves. And I'm like, whoa, what's going on here? It says these pastors suffer from depression and these pastors suffer from guilt from the sins that they have. The devil is a liar. Because the devil wants you to quit on what God has called you to be. But I want you to know this. When you are weak, you are your strongest. Don't let the devil trip you and trap you and get you to quit the path that God has set before you. Because the Bible says here, if you put God first, your latter days shall be greater than your former days. That means that you keep living, Sister Christine. You ain't seen your biggest car yet. You ain't seen your biggest house yet. You ain't seen what God has for you. You got to keep going. Don't you quit right now because if you stop right now, it's over. The lowest point in my life was when I was homeless. As I passed those homeless men tonight, a hundred of them, I looked at one of them and I saw myself. And I thought about this. I said, what if I would have stopped right there at homelessness? What if I would have just kept sleeping under bushes? But I thank God for this. I had a praying mama and a praying grandmama and a praying big mama. And when I was homeless, here's what saved me. I got two jobs. This is how I got a homelessness. I got two jobs. I was working 16 hours per day. I got two jobs. So I worked so much that I really didn't have time to go and sleep underneath the bushes. And the thing is, I worked so much and then had money that I could get an apartment. God will provide a way for you to escape what you're going through. But you got to be willing to do your part. You can't say, God, get me out of this situation. And God's like, well, I am, but you got to do A, B, and C. God will do everything for you. If I didn't get those two jobs, I wouldn't know none of you. But I got two jobs, and that helped me to find a pathway out of homelessness. So when you pass by tonight as you're going home, and you see that man sleeping on a bus stop, you can say, wow, that was H. That was me. I told you I slept in a Burger King bathroom. That was me. I would break into apartments at night and sometimes sleep on a little couch and get up and leave quick early in the morning before the people came back. That was me. You don't know what God has delivered you from, but God will deliver you. So don't stop now. Right now you going through the struggle. Right now it don't make sense. Right now you ain't got no money. Right now you stressed out. But God says if you keep going down this street, your latter days shall be greater than your former days. God will bless you, but you got to keep going and do what he's called you to do. And the very last thing, and the very last thing, turn to Jeremiah 29 and 11. Jeremiah 29 and 11. 
Jeremiah 29 and 11. Thank you, Jesus. Jeremiah 29 and 11. Jeremiah 29 11 says this, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you the expected end. God says, I'm thinking about you. And he's thinking towards you. And he's thinking thoughts of peace. And he has an expected end for you. God has an expected end for your life. He has thoughts of peace for your life. So if right now, if you don't have peace, check your relationship with God. Well, well I don't have enough money. I'm going to tell you one thing. When I was homeless, I had peace. It was just me underneath the bushes, sleeping underneath the cover. I had peace. When I was riding my bicycle, uh, one time time, I tried to ride my bicycle from Irvine to South Central LA. I got as far as Sepulveda and Crenshaw and I stopped because I couldn't move anymore. My legs had locked up. I literally fell off the bike because I couldn't move any further. And uh, thank God, a nice white man was driving by and saw me laid on the sidewalk and came and picked me up and I went to a phone booth and called somebody. There were no cell phones. This was the 80s. The point is, these are some of the struggles that I had. But God saw the determination in my heart because I'm not a quitter. And I'm telling you the same thing. You're not a failure. Just because it didn't work doesn't mean you're a failure. Just because you had an abortion, you're not a failure. Just because you lost that baby, you're not a failure. Just because you lost that job, you're not a failure. Just because you lost that relationship, you're not a failure. Just because you got kicked out of school, you're not a failure. Just because your mama pushed you out the house, you're not a failure. You are not a failure. Because God has an expected end for you. He says this is not your end. He said, if you're latter day, if you ain't got good stuff, if you don't have peace, this is not the end. So my message to you is keep going. Keep going. Keep going. You young. It don't make sense. You broke. It don't make sense. You ain't got no car that run right. It don't make sense. You on the bus all the time. It don't make sense. You sleeping in somebody else's couch. It don't make sense. God says, keep going because I got great things for you. And tonight when I was writing this, the tears came in my eyes because I thought about when I could have gave up. I thought about when I should have gave up. But God says, keep going. There was a little voice that always told me, keep going. So my message to you is, keep going. Don't you stop right now. It's not the time to quit. Keep going. And if you keep persevering, God will make a way. The Bible says we walk by faith not by sight. So stop looking around you looking for answers. Stop looking around you looking for validation. God says you won't be able to see the blessings that I have for you, but he's going to put you in a place and you're going to wake up and say, how did I end up in this $5,000 bed? How did I end up in this $700,000 house? How did I end up driving this bed? How did I end up taking these trips? How did I end up with all this money in my bank account? How did I end up with all these kids? How did I end up married? How did I end up with this because God says, if you keep going, he will make a way. Everybody stand. Give God a hand clap. Hallelujah. going to be the hardest year of your life. Some of y'all 20, so you already know what I'm talking about. 19 is a year of disappointment. 19 is a year of wow. 19 is a year when you have some of your greatest failures. 19 is a year where you have some of your greatest disappointments. 19 is a tough year. What I love about you, Ja, is that at 19, you made a decision to follow God, and you got covered. You avoided all the foolishness that most of us are stuck in right now. So 19 is that year. But guess what comes after 19? 20, 25, 35, 
45. If you keep going, you won't be in the same place that you are today. You will be somewhere else. But you have to keep going. You can't stop here. Because here is not a good space for some of y'all. Some of y'all are going through right now. Some of y'all are suffering and it don't make sense. That's why God said, don't you stop here. God wants you to continue to keep moving. There's a song back in the 80s that said, keep on moving. Keep on moving. You gotta keep moving. You can't stand still. I told my son when we moved to Compton, I said, rule number one, don't you stay in one place too long. You always gotta keep your head. You don't you get caught slipping. You gotta keep moving. Don't you stand in one place too long. You gotta keep moving, keep progressing. Does that mean I move from apartment to apartment? No, that's called inconsistency. Keep moving means moving forward. Keep making plans, keep getting job interviews, keep trying to buy stuff, keep making plans to get a progression forward. Set goals for yourself and make it happen. Uh, if you gotta start out, uh, one thing about me, and I thank God for this, I have no pride when it comes to me, person. My son laughs at me sometimes. I had, that's why I can drive a raggedy car, I don't care. I can look crazy and go to the store, I don't care. So when I was in college, I was a janitor. I worked at 7-Eleven. I worked at fast food. I worked at pizza restaurants. I sold, I even sold sandwiches out of a cooler. I walked around from door to door with knock on people's doors selling sandwiches. The thing is, you can't be so proud you can't do a work. Because if you're that proud, God can't bless you with what he has for you. You got to learn how to crawl before you can run. So if you can crawl, God will give you legs to run. Never be so proud that you turn down jobs. I don't do fast food. That's a lie to pit of hell. It's an honest day work, do the work. Because there's something you're gonna learn in that fast food joint that you ain't gonna learn as a corporate executive over there in Kaiser. God wants you to learn the lessons low so he can take you high. So when I was out there selling sandwiches door to door, God had lessons for me. When I was at Burger King scrubbing the floors with a toothbrush because I had an evil manager, God was blessing me. When, when I was a, a maid and I was cleaning up bedrooms, God was with me. I done did some weird jobs, but God always kept me going forward. So never have so much pride that you stop and say, I, I'm, I'm too high for this. I'm 19, I can't work in fast food. There's something for you in and out that you're not gonna get working in the mall at Macy's. Never have so much pride that you turn down jobs. Because right now, this is the age. You're low, but keep going. Because as you keep going, you will get greater and greater and greater. Amen. Give God a hand clap. Hallelujah. Anybody have no word for the rest of the <laughs> Minister Trey? No? Ain't nobody? All right, everybody grab a hand. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank Father for the bounty of youth that's here tonight. Father, we thank for the word that went forth. Father, we ask that you heal our hearts, heal our bodies, heal our minds. Heal our dreams, heal our families, heal our finances. Heal the way that we think. Heal the, the, the tolls that's in our body and forgive us of our sins. And thank you, Father, for making a way out of no way, for forgiving us of the sins that we can't stop doing. Some of us can't stop smoking weed. Some of us can't stop having sex and stop having getting tattoos. And some of us can't stop scamming. We got all these things that we're into. God, thank you for covering us and for protecting us when the enemy tried to kill us. Squeeze the hand next to you. I squeeze life into that hand. I squeeze prosperity into that hand. I squeeze vision and purpose into that hand. I squeeze that these young people come to hand and not to tell, that they become victorious and never defeated, and that no weapon formed against them shall prosper. We speak life, we speak health, we rebuke the devil, we rebuke doubt, we rebuke anything that's the spirit of fear, and we speak love and protection. And we ask all that in Jesus' name. Amen. Give God a hand clap.